All right, let's get started. Welcome to lecture four for DSC 10. Um, hope you guys had a good July 4th weekend. Um, let's see, thumbs up if you use your weekend to sleep a lot. Thumbs up if you did something interesting or fun over the weekend. Thumbs up if you saw fireworks. Anyone see fireworks? Some fireworks? Where'd you, where'd you see fireworks going? Mission Bay. Oh, you went to Mission Bay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Henry, I saw you had the thumbs up. Did you see yeah. fireworks too? Yeah. Where did you, where did you go look? Uh, the USS Midway. Oh, the Midway. Okay. Yeah, I had some friends who went there too. I heard, it was, I heard traffic was really bad. Was the traffic? Did you yeah. drive there? My friend who went there said she took like an hour and a half just to get out of that area. It's like when, when the fireworks were done, her and her friends wanted to like drive back home to like here La Jolla. And then she took like, a, it took her like an hour and a half to get onto the freeway from like, from like the Barcadero area. It was, it was pretty rough. Um, me and my girlfriend, we went to like a little ferry they had in her, in her town. She lives like, she lives up north, like more like north, north uh, east. And so we just went to like a little ferry they had um, like 12 bouncy houses. And then um, I rode down like one of the bouncy house slides and got like a pretty bad like bird on my hand because I was like trying to stop myself from going on the slide too fast. But yeah, anyway, hope you guys had fun. And I think July 4th is the only holiday we're gonna have this summer. The next holiday you'll have in this, for, like in the academic calendar will probably be um, like Labor Day, I think. So that'll be a while before you, get, before you get a real like holiday. So I um, hope you guys got some good rest, got a chance to catch up for the class. Um, and we're getting right back into it. So this week, we're gonna be talking about arrays. Um, on Friday, we'll be talking about data frames. And this is where, this is a part of the class where the difficulty really starts to ramp up. Okay, so um, I always suggest like really, uh, if you're watching it on the podcast, like I would, I would hope that you can watch the lectures like as soon as possible after they come out. Um, so that you have a chance to let the material sink in. Because it does take a little while, especially if you haven't used data frames before, it takes a while for the material to sink in. And I really want you to have the time to um, understand the material, to not feel like you're, you're being rushed through it. Um, and to just have a good time like learning, learning the class. All right, uh, good job turning in lab one and homework one. I, I looked through the submission, most of them look great. Uh, most people turn in lab one and homework one on time. And we're gonna aim to have homework one graded this week. So there are some free response questions on the homework one. Um, there won't always be free response questions on the homework, um, but because this time we had um, questions about causality and experiments, um, we, had, uh, we had some few response questions that our tutors are going to be grading, hopefully by the end of this week, but uh, at the end of next week at the latest. Okay, so the big change is that uh, we're pushing back the assignment deadlines because of July 4th. So no, before, we were planning to have our labs due on Saturday and our homeworks due on Tuesday. Um, and I took a look at the lab and homework that we're going to be assigned for this week, and I realized that um, there just wasn't enough time to really learn the material and prepare for the lab before you have to turn in the assignment. So um, in the original schedule, we would learn about data frames on Friday and then to use data frames a lot on the lab would, that would have been due on Saturday. That's, that's pretty difficult. So I want to give you, guys, give you some more time to go to office hours and get help. Um, so we're pushing back all the deadlines. The labs are now due on Tuesday and the homeworks are due on Saturday. And more importantly, there's nothing due this week. So nothing due this Saturday. The next assignment that's due for the class is lab two, which is due on Tuesday, July 12th. Likewise, on homework two, we're going to release later on this week. And that'll be due uh, next Saturday, so next week, Saturday, on July 16th. So nothing due for a, for a week's worth of time, pretty much. Um, but that's, that's because the material is getting harder. Um, I do suggest that when the lab is out, that you review it, um, that you at least look it over and, and try to see what you're getting yourself into. Okay, so today, we're going to talk about strings. I mean, didn't get to cover it last time, but we wanted, so we want to fit it in here this is the beginning of this lecture. We're going to be talking about lists, arrays, ranges, and at the very end, I'll give you a little bit of introduction to data frames, but I think that most of the material will be starting off from. Again, um, we're going to be covering a lot of content, and there are some ways that you can get help. So the main way that you can get help in this class is via office hours and campus wire. Um, on Campus Wire, I do want to emphasize that, um, that like, we really prefer if you make a post on Campus Wire. I know uh, my TA has mentioned that some students have been DMing her, like direct messaging her on Campus Wire. Um, and our policy is that like, we don't really like when, when students DM the TA 
because oftentimes a question that the TA gets can be answered like for the whole class. So if you have a question about the assignment, chances are pretty good that someone else in the class also has a question, and it would really help the class out if you could just make a post instead of um, DMing our TA. And I told our, I told our TA that you can answer it to direct messages if you want to, but you're not obligated to. So at any point in time, she can say, hey, like, um, sorry I don't have time to answer this question, but if you make a post on it, um, I can answer it later, or the TAs can answer, or the tutors can answer it when they have when they check campus wire. Okay, let's talk about streams. So last time we talked about um, integers and floats. Okay. So we talked about how integers um, store like numbers that don't have a decimal place, like the number two or forty-two. We talked about how floats store numbers that do have a decimal place, like one point three three or three point one four. There is a third main data type that we'll cover in this class. And that data type is called a string. Strings contain text. This is a string. Okay. And the idea behind a string is it needs to have quotes. And it can be either single quotes or double quotes. So if I do quote, single quote with, single quote, this works. If I do double quote with, this works. Um, but if I type in a number here, it looks like a number when it's displayed, but you'll see that in the output for Jupyter, Jupyter does put quotes around it to make sure you know that it's the string and not a number. The reason why it's important to know this is because um, we can use arithmetic on strings. So let's say I have a string uh, S1, and I set S1 equal to the string tiny. Oops, tiny. S2 is equal to the string panda. So I have these two strings. If I do S1 plus S2, I get tiny panda. So in Python, if you take two strings, you use a plus sign, Python smashes the strings together into one longer string. So S1 plus S2 is one longer string, contains the word tiny panda. Now, you might look at this and you're, you're going to think, well, this is two words, shouldn't there be a space between two words? And yes, if I wanted a space here, I could do plus, um, single quote, space, and then another plus. And what this does, it does tiny, and it adds a space to it, and then adds the word panda. To the string. Okay. Let's say I want to add. Um, so the reason why this is important is because let's say I have the string uh, 12 and the string 10. Now, if I do S1 plus S2, if you think that S1 and S2 are numbers, then you would guess that S1 plus S2 is 22. But in fact, when you run it, it's not 22. Oops. Let me run this and then run this. It's the string 1210. Because when you have two strings, Python doesn't recognize that they're numbers, even if the only thing that they contain is numbers. When you do the plus sign, it smashes the strings together just like it would any other string. And we get the string 1210 and not the number 1210. OK, now let's go back to tiny kind of. Uh, one last little arithmetic you can do with strings, which is kind of neat, um, is if you do s1 times 3, you get tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, if you do S1 plus space times 3, you get tiny, tiny, tiny with spaces in between. All right. Now, there are some useful things that we can do with strings. Okay? So there, uh, there are some methods that we call string methods. And the way methods work in, in Python for strings is, let's say I have a string here called my cool string. If I want to uppercase the whole thing, I can do my cool string dot upper parentheses. And the whole stream becomes uppercase. So data science is super cool. I think so too. The syntax here is a little bit different than the syntax you've seen before. All right? Before we saw something that might have looked like, let's try this, uh, len of my cool string, or let's say absolute value. So we did absolute value of negative 2. And we saw this last lecture. Notice how the function name appears here, and then we have parentheses, and then we have the argument here, negative 2. The difference between this one and the one uh, that saw above it is that this is a method on a string, and so you have to do my cool string dot upper. There's another method called replace. So if I do, uh, let's say I want to replace super cool with maybe, let's say, um, you can put an emoji. Let's put the emoji 100. 100 times 3. And if I do that, then, the then what it does is it takes the substring super cool, replaces it with three 100 emojis. All right. One final thing you should know is if you want to figure out how long a string is, 
then we have to do let. So let of my full string is 27, and if you do len parentheses with the string inside of it as your argument, then it'll count up however, however many characters are in the string. All right. Uh, this is supposed to appear on a new slide. Let me see if I can fix it real quick here. Slideshow, make it appear, please. Thanks. Okay, now, there will come a point in time where you want a string, but it needs to have quotes in it. So let's say um, you might say something like, I can't do that, and put an end quote there. If you do that, then Python will give you a syntax error. Okay, and the reason why it gives you a syntax error is because it thinks that when you have the apostrophe in the can't, it closes off the string here, and then this stuff here, is, it's confusing to Python. So Python does not know what to do with this part here when you have the string. One way to get around this is to use double quotes instead of single quotes. So if I have double quotes here, then this is fine, because the, stuff, the single quote here doesn't conflict with the double quote. The other way to get around it is to do um, to escape it. So when we, let's say I, I really have to use single quotes for whatever reason. Um, if I still want the single quote in the string, but I don't want Python to mess up the interpretation of that apostrophe, then I can put a backslash. If I put a backslash here, this tells Python, I'm not trying to end the string here. This is just the character um, single quote. And if I run that, then I get the same result. I can't do that. And that's fine for Python. So just, just a little thing that you have to keep, uh, keep an eye out for. All right. Let me talk about print. So I mentioned last lecture that Jupyter only displays the last result, last line in the cell. What does that mean? So let's say I type in uh, 2 plus 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. If I put a line above 10 plus uh, 11 and I run the cell, I still only see the number 4 because Jupyter only displays the last line even though it runs all the lines before the last line. If I really want to see something that didn't happen directly on the last line of a cell, then I can use the print function. If I do print 10 plus 11, then what Python will do is it'll print the number 21, as you see here, and then 2 plus 2 is output as the last line of the cell. Okay. And the reason why this is uh, sometimes useful is because with strings, um, let's try this. So let's do uh, my new line string. Let's say here's, oops, here is a string with two lines. Um, sometimes you have strings that have uh, two lines in them. And in Python, the backslash n character says add a new line to the string. So what does that mean? It means that I can do um, like here is the second line. Close that string. Oh my gosh. Okay. Now, if I just display my new line string, you see that this just appears on one big line here. But if I print it, or print it instead, this new line um, becomes a line break. So you see now, here's a string with two lines. The, the backslash n doesn't appear, but instead it just tells Python to do a line break, and then we can display a second line. So sometimes we get a long string that has backslash n characters in it. Um, by default, if you just display the string, it will display as one really long line. And if you want to show up properly with line breaks and like paragraphs and stuff, then you have to use the print function. Okay, here we go. Let's talk about type conversion. So, we can convert between strings to numbers and back. Um, it's pretty common to do in data science because, for example, like if you have the string, let's say, it, let's say you load a data file, let's say someone gave you an Excel spreadsheet, you load it into Python, and you might see the string, let's say, um, you might see a string like 1,000, 0, 2, 4. And you want to convert this to a number so Python can, you can do arithmetic on it. So the way we do this is with type conversion. And the way we do type conversion is uh, we use a function stir, int, and float. I'll show you how this works. So if I do stir on a number, then this converts that to a string. So before, this was just the number 3. If I do stir on this number, we get the string three instead of the number three. Let's go the other way around. So let's say we take float and we put in the number three. If we do that, then we get the float floating point number 3.0. If we do into three, we get the number three. So three little functions here just to do some conversion. Stir converts things to strings. 
Int converts things to integers. Float convert converts things to floats. Now, there are some times where um, you can't convert the thing to an integer. So let's say I type in the, the word bunny to and try to do it and try to convert this to an integer. What happens here is Python will complain and will tell me this is invalid. Uh, it's invalid literal for int with base 10 bunnies. Basically, this what the way you should interpret this is to think, okay, well I tried to give Python something that wasn't a number, um, and Python's complaining because it tried to convert it into a number, but it doesn't know how to. Okay, so here's a question for you. Let's say you ran the following statements, x equals 3, y equals quote 4, and z equals quote 5.6. Select the expression that would be evaluated without an error. Let me just test your knowledge here. Um, go to menti.com and enter in that code, or use your phone to scan this QR code. Um, again, for these programming questions, it'd be really great if you don't just run the code yourself in Jupyter right away. Um, I really want you to look at this code and try to take a guess. Um, one, because when you take a guess, it helps you remember the material better and just helps you not have to review the material as often to yourself after class ends. And two, because later on in the class we'll be taking um, some exams. And on the exams, you won't have access to Jupyter. I mean, you have to interpret the code yourself. So I, I include these questions um, not just to tease you or not just to like, make you feel like, um, like I'm doing, making you do something unreasonable, um, but because later on in the class we will ask you to do something like this for the exams. Okay, so, um, give it a shot, go to menti.com, try this question. See if this works. Oh, yeah, some answers for B, some answers for D. Give you a few more minutes, just, just one, more, one more minute or so to look, to look at that. Thanks for trying it out. Let's reset the results here so I can do this again next time. Okay, so let's try it out. Uh, we had we had x equals three, y equals quote four, z equals quote five point six. Now, first thing was we did x plus y, oops, plus y. Uh, this will break because x is an integer and y is a string, and Python doesn't like it when you try to smash two types together and then you don't convert between the two. If we wanted to make this code work, we could do a stir of x plus y, and now because x and y are both strings, this is fine. So whenever we do addition, um, Python makes you, like requires you to have both things be the same type, and you have to convert between two types if the types are different. Let's do a second one. Uh, x plus int, oh, it sounds like a party, y plus z. OK, so this is close. Um, what happens here? When we do y plus z, this creates the string 45.6. But when we try to do int of that, um, Python complains because Python can't make an int out of the non-integer. So it says, uh, we can't convert 4 or 5.6 for an integer because it doesn't know what to do with this 0.6. The 0.6 is confusing to int. So that's why, that's why um, this one doesn't work. Okay. Um, if we do stir of x plus int of y, this breaks because of the same reason why I mentioned before. Um, we can't add strings of integers. And the last one, if you do stir of x plus z, this is fine because stir of x makes 
a string, and z is a string, so we add the two together, you get a string 3, 5, and 6. All right, great. Any questions about strings before we move on to lists? All right, let's move on. Okay, so um, in data science, usually we don't work with just single numbers or single strings at a time. Usually we work with lots of numbers or lots of strings at a time. And the way that we store these lots of data is via sequences or lists. So one way that we can store this in Python is via um, lists. For example, let's say we wanted to keep track of all the temperatures in the month of January um, this past year, or the age of every user on TikTok, or the salary of every MBA player. Now, if we try to do this using only what we know in the class so far, then we might try something like this, where we say, OK, well, the temperature on January 1st was 68 degrees. Temperature on January 2nd was 72. Um, temperature on January 3rd was 65. And make every single number its own variable. And um, we could do this, but it becomes a pain. And the reason why it becomes a pain is because you do something. Let's say you want to do the average temperature in January. Um, if you want to do this strategy, then you would have to write something like average temperature equals 1 over 31 times, and you can add every single variable here, you know, 31 different variables together. What a pain. So instead, what we'll use is Python lists. Python has a built-in um, data type for working with sequences, and that data type is called a list. To create a list, uh, the easiest way to do that is to put brackets, so these are square brackets, it's like right next to the P character on your keyboard, the square brackets. And I can type in some numbers here. I can type in whatever I want, so let's do 68, 72, let me just put in the temperatures from the last slide, 64, 62, 64, 62, and 61. And this is a list containing six numbers. I'll store that in a variable, so let's call this temperature list. And again, I can do that to display the value as a number. Okay. Len also works on lists too. So if I do len of temperature list, then I get the value six because there are six numbers in this list. Okay. So once I have this list in Python, um, it's pretty easy to find the average temperature in the month of January because there are some functions that work particularly well with lists. Here's temperature list. If I take the sum of this list, then I get the total, uh, it adds up all the numbers inside the list. And if I divide by the len of the list, then I get the average temperature for all the numbers in my list. So this is great. Um, now, the reason, there's only one real reason why we talk about lists in Python. Um, and that's because lists are like the built-in Python data type for sequences. But in this class, we actually don't use lists that much. And the reason why we don't use lists that much is because lists are very slow. So if you have uh, millions of numbers or billions of numbers, then working with lists is significantly slower than using um, this library that we'll call that, um, called NumPy. Okay. So NumPy provides a data type called an array. And basically, for the rest of this class, we'll be working with arrays and not so we'll give you a little bit of practice with lists on, on the homeworks, but you should expect that for the most part, we're going to be using arrays instead. Arrays are almost the same as lists, they're very similar, um, but the main thing is that they work a lot faster. Arrays are not built into Python by default, and um, you have to install a package called NumPy in order to use arrays. And data help, we've already installed that package for you. Um, but you should know that if you install Python on your, own, on your own laptop for whatever reason and you try to use NumPy arrays, um, they won't work because you need to install NumPy separately from, from Python. On data hub, it's already installed for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Um, here's a logo. And to use NumPy, we need this line here that says import NumPy as MP. If I run that cell, then what this does is it loads the NumPy library, and that's what lets me use arrays. Okay, so how do I make an array? To make an array, we call np.array, and we give it a list. So 
this is the syntax here. The syntax is mp.array, and it looks tricky. Um, we have to do parentheses, bracket, some numbers here, and then close bracket, close parentheses. So the order here really matters. You can't do bracket and then parentheses. You have to do parentheses and then bracket. And at the end, you can't do parentheses and then bracket. You have to do bracket and then parentheses. Um, if you're just starting off learning Python, basically what you should do is just copy and paste this line. Most of the time, you shouldn't, you shouldn't worry about typing yourself because um, when you type it yourself, like people just run into all sorts of typos. So I really suggest if you're trying to, if you're just starting off learning it, I would just say just copy and paste, and that's fine. Let me just show you what I mean. What I mean. So here, np dot array, and in the brackets I put in um, some numbers. Let me put in the temperature numbers: 72, 65, 64, 62, 61. All right. Now this looks very similar to the list of temperatures. But you'll see that if I put the list here, they display a little bit differently. So the array, um, Python will tell me that this is an array and not a list. You should notice that this thing inside mp.array is a list. So you saw, you watched me just copy out this part in the middle here and paste it below, and this was a Python list. And indeed, the way that mp.array creates arrays is you give it a list to convert into an array. Okay, so the thing inside the parentheses for mp.array array needs to be um, a Python list or some other Python sequence of some sort. In this case, I put in a list of numbers and it, it converts that list into an array of numbers. All right, so here, let's call this temperature array. Temperature array. And let me paste that. All right. And this was our temperature of this one. So just for you to compare the array here and the list here. OK. So we can get the individual items back out from an array. The thing inside of an array, I call its elements. So we say that um, an array with six things inside has six elements. Elements is a technical term for it. Every element has a position. And the way we get items back out of the array is we tell it to give us the, the zeroth item, or the first item, or the second item. And the reason why we say zero is because Python um, is zero indexed. Let me just show you what I mean. So here's my array. If I want the number 68, okay, the first number in that array, the syntax for that is square bracket and then zero. And that gets me the number 68. So let me do that again. Let me move it down here. So here's temperature array. If I want the first number, I do bracket 0. If I want the second number, I do bracket 1 to get 72. Okay? Um, I'm sure you're wondering, like, why does Python do that? Why can't we just do 1, 2, 3? And the reason is, basically, it's just the way that languages were designed. If you take like, more advanced courses, you'll, you'll understand a little bit more about why we have 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, you'll, if you learn other languages, too, you'll see the same pattern where they use um, 0 indexing, which is, which is what we call it, starting at the number 0. And so here, for now, I would just suggest remember that if you want the first thing, you need to do the number zero. Okay. Let's keep going. So I can do, uh, let's say, okay, so what does bracket three get me? Well, bracket three gets me the fourth element in the list in the array, sorry, so because we started at zero. So this is zero, one, oops, one, two, three. So bracket three will get me 64. So here is 3, and then here is 4, and then here is 5. So if I want the last one, I can do bracket 5 to get 61. What happens if I try to do bracket 6? Python complains. So it will give me an error like this. It says index 6 is out of bounds. For access 0 with size 6, this is basically Python's technical way of saying, your array only has 6 things in it. And you um, try to get index number 6, but that's out of bounds, because the last index for an array with six elements is number five. So here's, here's 61, and this is the last number of the array. OK, so here's some nifty tricks we can do with arrays. We can do arithmetic on arrays, and it's very easy to do that. So here, temperature array. Let's say I want to increase all the numbers by three. I want to add three to all the degrees. 
Okay, so this might happen, for example, in real life, if we know that we have a temperature reader outside that we put outside more lecture hall, um, but we know that temperature is like, it records lower temperatures than what is actually the real temperature. So that happens sometimes with sensors, it's just called having a bias. And a lot of times what companies will do with these sensors is they'll just correct the bias um, when they read the data from that, from that particular sensor. So let's say we you know that the sensor has a bias of three, so we need to add three to all the numbers inside the array. We can do that by just doing plus three. Okay, so if I do plus three on an array, it takes 68. Let me do it down here. And it adds three to it to get 71. It takes 72 and adds three to it. It takes 65 and adds three to it. So on and so forth. So when we do arithmetic on arrays, um, the arithmetic is applied on every element of the array individually. For a divide in temperatures by two, that's pretty easy to do. I can do pretty much anything I want here. So if I divide by two, I get 34. 72 divided by two is 36. So on and so forth. So anything I can do um, within the number, I can do with an array. So let's say I want to convert the numbers to Celsius. So to convert to Celsius, the formula is 5 over 9 times their temperature array minus 32. And that works on the y as you expect. So first, Python will do take the temperature array, subtract 32 from each one, and then multiply all the numbers by 5 over 9. OK. Now, the thing to remember here is, when I'm doing this arithmetic on an array, I haven't changed the temperature array. What do I mean by that? If I type in a temperature array here and run it, I get back the original array. Okay? My array did not change because I did math on it. Um, it only changes if I do temperature array equal sign something else on the right hand side. So the only time I can change temperature array itself is if I use the equal sign assignment expression. If I just type in math up here, I can do whatever I want and temperature array will not change every time I run this sum. It only changes if I copy and paste this and then put it over here. If I do that, then temperature array will change. But if I don't have an equal sign here, then temperature array, pretty much no matter what I do to it, will not change what it has. Now, if I want to add two arrays together, Python, um, NumPy does that as well. So let's say I have A1 and A2. Both of them have three numbers. A1 plus A2 add together the numbers. So we see here that we do 1 plus 4 to get the first element, 2 plus 5 to get the second, 3 plus negative 6 to get the third element, so on and so forth. So as long as the arrays are the same length, we can do arithmetic with them too. If I do A1 divided by A2, this works just as you expect. OK, so let's go through an example. Let's say I have four babies, and they, have, they weigh this much. And I want to find, and I know that the average weight, generally speaking, for a newborn baby is 3.3 kilograms. So I want to know how far are each of the baby's weights from the weight of an average newborn. So what I would like to do is I would like to know 3.4 minus 3.3, 3.2 minus 3.3, so on and so forth. So here I have a cell where I create the array of four baby weights. And here I have the average weight for all babies, which is 3.3. Okay. To find a deviation of weight from the average weight, I can just subtract a number. So I have four weights here. And I have average weight here, which is 3.3. To find the deviation from the average, I can just subtract. That's a deviation. If I want to convert the weights to pounds, then I can do four weights times 2.2. Um, because there are 2.2 there are 2.2 pounds in the kilogram, so if I do times 2.2, um, I can do I can do that as well pretty quickly. And the main the main nice thing about doing this in Python and NumPy, um, instead of using regular Python lists is that the code to do this same operation using a regular Python list is a lot longer, and it requires learning something called a for loop, um, which we'll learn later on in the class, but it just requires more code, it's more complicated. Um, in NumPy, arithmetic is just really easy, and that's why we do it. And also, 
it's significantly faster than using base Python to add the same numbers together. So if we had, uh, let's say, 100 like, million elements in this array, um, in Python, to add, to multiply each of them by 2.2 might take me, like, let's say, like 2 seconds to do, or 10 seconds, let's say. Um, but in NumPy, the same thing can be done in like, a fraction of a second, maybe less than, less than like, 0.2 seconds or so. So NumPy just works way faster than base Python, maybe like, at least 10, but probably up to 100 times faster. And that's why we use it for data science. All right, so again, four weights. If I want to figure out how many numbers are inside, I can always do len. Here's one. Okay, let's, let's go for another example. I uh, already did that in the past couple of things. All right. So here's a longer array. This is the daily high temperatures in San Diego from August of 2018. Um, you see the temperatures are, are pretty good. If you've lived somewhere else in the US, you know that usually in, in other places in the US, these temperatures are a lot higher. Um, in, in San Diego, August, is, we're still in the 80s degrees in Fahrenheit, so we can still go to the beach and have a good time, and we won't be like just all sweaty all the time. So here are the temperatures. How many days are in August? There are 31 days in August. With the race, um, I can do something pretty similar to list. Let's say I want to find the average temperature. We have temps here. I can, again, take the sum of temps, which is just a big number, and divide by the len of temps, and that's the average temperature in August. Pretty simple. Arrays have some methods, too. So again, if I call a method on an array, um, there's a different syntax for it. So I can do temps dot sum parentheses instead of sum parentheses temps. This works the same way as doing sum of temps. It just happens that um, this one works using the NumPy like, summation thing rather than Python summation thing. If I do divide by len temps, this gives me the same result. Um, these two things are equivalent. I'm just showing you two different ways of doing the same thing. One reason why um, we, like, we like using methods is because there are more methods available on arrays than there are built into Python. So let's say I want to just find the mean temperature. Well, in fact, NumPy has an easier way of doing that. I can just do .mean, and that gives me the same result as the one up here. I cannot do mean of temps. This is an error, because Python doesn't have a mean function built into it. So if I want to find the mean temperature using .mean, I have to use Temps dot mean parentheses. I have to use this syntax. Um, the reason why we're using this syntax here is because this says use NumPy's function, not Python's function. If I want to find the max, I can do that as well. Um, and Python, Python has a, and NumPy has a max and min, so I can do max and min. I can do standard deviation as well. So I don't have to do this long calculation of standard deviation. I can just do standard deviation using ST. Yeah, so would there still be a case of like you need it, when you're using NumPy, do you still need to import like the math uh, function or no? Yeah, so the question was if we're using NumPy, will we ever need to import the math package? So we talked about how last lecture we sometimes want to do import math. And if we do that, we can do math.square root of 2 to get, to get like 1.14. Um, actually, NumPy pretty much copies over all the functions in math except the, it makes the function also work for array, so it's doubly convenient. And what, what does that mean? I can do something that looks like, uh, let's say I want to do the square root of all these temperatures. I can do np.square root instead of math.square root of temperatures, and that takes the square root of each number in the array. So again, uh, let me do that. Before I had to do math.square root of 2. Instead of math, I do np.square root of an array, and this works element-wise um, on every element of the array. It works really fast, and it does that for all the numbers at once. So uh, I know I showed you how to use math in like the previous lecture. Sometimes we'll use math, but most of the time we'll just use np dot with the same method because they do the same thing. So if I do np of square root of 2, I also get the number of 1.14. It just happens that np's square root method also works on arrays, which is just like a bonus on top of what math does. That's yeah, a great question. OK. Great, we're doing good on time. Let's go to ranges. So um, ranges are like a convenience thing for working with arrays because oftentimes we want to find array. We want to make arrays like this. So we want to, let's say, 
all the days in January, and we type in the numbers like one, two, three, four, all the way up to 31. And that's kind of a pain to do. Um, let's say we have like a thousand numbers to type in, and that's a lot of numbers to type in. So we don't want to do that manually, one by one. Instead, we can use a function called a range. A range is an array of either consecutive numbers or evenly spaced numbers. The way the syntax works is there are um, three ways of calling a range. So the first way is if you do np.a range and just put in the last number that we want. Let me try it here. If I do a range of 10, I get the number 0 through 9. And the reason why it does that is because it excludes the last number and it starts at 0. So this array still has 10 numbers in it. If I do np at a range of 10, I get 10 numbers. But the numbers start at 0 and go up to 9. Second way of calling a range is by specifying the start and the end. So let's say I want the numbers from 2 to 9. I can do that by doing 2 comma 10. And that says take the number that go from 2 to 9. OK. Finally, the last way is to do start, end, and step. And what that means is let's say I want the even numbers between 2 and 10. If I do comma 2 here, then I get the even numbers 2, 4, 6, 8. OK. Now, uh, people ask me, why does Python include the left number but not the right one? Right? So let's say I do 2 through 10. If you just look at this, um, the natural thing that you might think is you might think, OK, well, the numbers should go between 2 and 10. Why is there no 10 at the end of this array? And the reason why Python does that, um, there are a couple of reasons, but the main, like, math, the main like, reason for, conven for convenience sake is because, let's say you want to look at this array, and you want to know, you want to just look at this function, and you want to know how many numbers are inside the array. Well, right now what we can do is you can do, well, 10 minus 2 is 8, so I know that, I know that there are 8 numbers in this array. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 here. If it included the right endpoint, 10, then this array would have nine numbers in it, and you would do, um, you would have to count nine. You'd have to do 10 minus two plus one. So in Python, it's also pretty common to have like stacking ranges. And what I mean by that is, let's say I do np.a you know, range 10 to 20, like so. And if I had these two ranges together, um, you see how if I do 2 through 9, and then I go to 10 through 19, and there's no overlap between the two ranges, even though I had the same number here, 10. This happens kind of often in Python, and so one of the reasons why the right endpoint is always excluded in these ranges is because um, oftentimes there, are, there would be bugs if it included the 10 here, because now there's 10 in this array and also in this array. You might double count number 10. So you, it helps to avoid double counting, and it helps with when you're trying to just look at the array and try to see how many elements are inside of an array range. Okay, let's go through some more examples. So here's 2 to 10. Let's say I do 3 to 32, and I increment by 5. Is so it what will happen here? It'll go 3, and then add 5 to get 8, and then 13, 18, 23, 28, but when I add 5 to 28, I get to number 33, and 33 goes beyond 32, so it's not included. We stop at 20. I can do a fractional increments too. Let's say I go negative 3 to 2, and I move an increment to 0.5. I'll go from negative 3 to 2.5, so on and so forth. So that works as you might expect. Um, I can go decreasing numbers as well. So here we go, 8 to 1. Let's say I go down by negative 1. And that goes down from 8 all the way down to 1. But again, the right endpoint not included. So we don't include the number 1 here. We stop at a number 2. OK, great. So uh, you try it out. Okay, so let me give you this problem. It's a little bit tricky, but let's see if we can, see if we can decipher this. On the first day of January, you are paid 1 cent. Every day after, you are paid doubles. So it goes from 1 cent to 2 cents. To four cents to eight cents. If January has 31 days, then which of these expressions 
calculates the total amount of money you'll make in January in dollars. Let's take a look at it. Okay, if you have a neighbor, um, turn to your neighbor and try to see if you guys come up with the same answer. Um, if you don't have a neighbor, then just try to take out a piece of paper and see if you can like figure it out on paper if that if that helps you. Okay, so go ahead and talk about it. And then. So my whole process of choosing it was looking to see, if, see the power of two going outside of the parentheses or not. And it's not A when you make the most sense. Yes. I thought it was going to be too obvious, but I realized it probably is going to be one night because you're A the one side. Oh wait, hold up. Numbers like this mess up my head. Because that isn't included, right? The first day of the third person. Yeah. No, I see what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, that, that I didn't know. So it's a combo. Okay, so let's start with zero. Uh, I, would, I, would, I think you're right. I would choose B. I think B, yeah. I agree with the other stuff. I did not see the last one. No, I Okay, if you feel like you get to the same answer with you and your you and your neighbor, go to Menti and try to answer this question. Okay, let's see. We have some A's, and B's, a bunch of C's, and a few D's. Let's take a look. All right, so there are 31 days in January. From the NP.A range 31, I get the numbers 0 through 30. Now, if I do 2 times times this, then I take 2 to the power of every element inside of the survey. What will happen here is it will first do 2 to the power of 0, which is 1, 2 to the power of 1, which is 2. So I'll do 1, 2, 4, 8, so on and so forth. So let me just show that for you. Here's 1, 2, 4, 8, so on and so forth. So these are the cents I was paid on each day of January. Why is 32 not right? 32 is not right because this is January 1st, this is January 31st, and so this would be January 32nd, but there is no January 32nd. Let's say I was paid um, 2 cents on the first day of January instead of 1 cent. Okay, so if I, was, if I started from 2 cents on the first day of January instead of 1 cent, and I go all the way up to January 31st, then I would indeed, in that case, want to do something like 2, or sorry, 1, comma 32. Because that will say your first day of January you get paid two cents and then four cents, and this array still has thirty-one elements in it because we do we can look at thirty-two minus one, which is thirty-one. But in this case we do start at zero. Here we go, one cent. So this is this is what it is. Let me parenthesize this. And to convert to dollars, multiply by 
so 0 0.01, or divide by 100, same thing. And it looks funky, but if I take the sum here, dot sum, I see that I get paid a lot of money. So I get paid uh, you know, $21 million. It's pretty good. I would sign up for that salary. Okay, so the answer here was indeed the answer C. Um, but really, all the answers are pretty close. So I would, I would encourage you to take a look at the other answers, um, try to understand why, why A and B don't work, try to understand why D and D also does not work. OK, that's all we got for today. I'll see you on Friday. Right? Sorry? Lab 2 was released? Um, yes, I believe so. Because uh, it doesn't show up on. Oh, um, you have to click the link on the website. The campus website? Uh, on our DSC10.com website. Uh, yeah, I think only, only if you do, if you go to DSC10.com, not the first notes. Yeah, if you do that, then you'll see that. Um, so when you click that, it'll re download the latest files, and then you'll get to that. Okay, cool. Thank you. It's going to be up to something. I'm probably an hour, so you want to come Also, your name is Samantha, is that right? Okay, good to see you again. I'll try Mary. I'm, I'm not, my Chinese yeah. is not that good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. But, hey, Mary. Yeah. Uh, because I'm currently on the rollers. Okay. And based on your current number, I don't think I get in. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I just want to ask like, if I'm now in the official mode, uh, can I still access it in there? Or is it like, no? Um, you should be able to. So if you aren't able to right now, then we yeah. can add you. Um, can you just send me an email okay. afterward? Sure. Um, because basically what we have to do for waitlist people is we have to add them manually uh -huh. to Canvas. Uh -huh. um, and or like we have to add them, we have to, we have to say like give waitlist people access basically. Uh, um, okay. And then when that happens then like eventually waitlist people get access to Data Hub and everything else. Okay, um, so yeah. oh yeah, so because I don't think it has to access this code, I'm not sure that okay. we, um, I mean I'm not like receiving any group this code, so they're not like official anymore, but mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, can I still learn what I'm going to have? Because, I mean, yeah. because I'm still like deciding whether or not I'm going to major or like change my major to a minor. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I'm, I'm so you just want to try it out, see if it's yeah. something you like to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm also like double like majoring in graphic design as well. I'm oh, really? deciding okay. whether I'm going to major in like the, the design direction or like the uh, engineering direction. Oh, so, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, but so, yeah. I